Hey, how you doing? Thanks for downloading the show. This is Garden Fork Radio. It's me, Eric, with my friends talking about what we think are interesting things. Hopefully you will uh, also find it all interesting. It's uh, kind of a mashup of DIY and cooking gardening stuff. I have a YouTube channel and I have this podcast. If this is your first time here, welcome. Uh, and one of my best friends, Rick, is here. Hey, man. Hey, good morning. How are you, my friend? If I can wake up and walk and talk, I do not complain. <laughs> I walk. Uh, I woke up on this side of the grass, and so I'm happy. Yeah. Yeah. You have a cemetery in your backyard, actually. Oh, I do. Right behind me. Um, it, uh, it's interesting to watch the machinery of death and uh, the different kinds of. Uh, it's a. Um, it's not any one denomination. Group's denomination cemetery, and so uh, last night, um, uh, kind of late in the evening, they had a late funeral. And it, uh, they were all out there kind of doing the uh, New Orleans send-off and the second line and everything as they danced out of the, the cemetery. And all that. Now, isn't that great? Good for them. Yeah, way to go. So when but, you when you pass, I'll have you cremated, and then I'll just dust you in the backyard cemetery there? Is that what we're going to do? Uh, actually, um, I think she who must be obeyed has an idea about uh, having me cremated and then dropping me in the Mediterranean somewhere oh, off, the back right. of her, off the back of her cruise ship. Because you know? <laughs> she's on a cruise ship right now. <laughs> well, not exactly. Uh, they're off the ship now. They uh, she took she. It, this is probably the last big sisters uh, cruise. Uh, they're some of them are getting a little older, but uh, they took Queen Mary across, uh, left from Brooklyn, your part of the country. Yep. And then um, uh, landed in uh, at uh, Southampton, and from there went on to um, uh, Bath. Uh, down to Oxford, over to see the Downton Abbey place. And now they're on a tour of Scotland. And so she'll be back uh, in about 10 days. Cool. Well, so. today, uh, Rick and I compiled a list of stuff. We're going to talk about an electric bicycle, uh, the power of hanging out with positive people. Uh, if you're dehydrated, that might be affecting your brain. Uh, how to share stuff without using an app. And we have some comments on our most recent podcast, plus whatever else pops into our heads, as you can tell from... The first uh, two and a half minutes of our conversation. Here. <laughs> <laughs> Stream of Consciousness podcast. Are there other podcasts like this? I would be. I look around on iTunes, and if you all could tell me, uh, radio at gardenfork.tv is the email address. Um, because there's so many podcasts now. There's like a quarter million or something. It's it's um, an enormous number. Yeah. And these networks, these podcast networks are cranking out shows, some of which I don't think are very good. Um, some of them I think are really good. So um, if there's kind of an indie podcast you like, I would love to hear about it and I will spread the word about it. Uh, one that I really like and our executive producer Jimmy likes is uh, the Space Rocket History Podcast. And Mike, the host of that, will be on the show. He's hard to get a hold of because he's on a he drives an RV around. So Space Rocket History Podcast. But I want to hear yours. All right, Eric. No, it's radio at gardenfork.tv. Okay. Yeah. Um, you know, speaking of podcasts, I guess we could lead off with that nice one. Yeah. Um, I heard, and we've talked about this several times, and so I'm not going to belabor the, the subject, but on um, Smart People Podcast, um, and that, like they say, it's, it's not done by smart people. It's just a podcast where we have smart people on, uh, they did episode 304 with Dr. Will and they call him Dr. Will B because I can't pronounce his last name either, but he's a, um, uh, internal medicine, uh, enterologist, gastroenterologist and with a hist with a, a master's in, um, and doing survey work and, and research and that kind of thing. And so he's a working doctor. He doesn't have any, uh, he's not selling anything, no pills or powders or whatever, but just the most informative, uh, interesting and detailed uh, discussion I've heard of the microbiome and how to change your gut bacteria, what's it's doing, what's it doing in there, uh, what affects it, what doesn't, um, a lot about uh, all these allergies that are popping up all of a sudden, you know, people thinking they have a, a gluten allergy and, and first one thing, another. And it was just a fascinating podcast. I put a link to it on the uh, Garden Fork uh, discussion page. On Facebook, yeah. On Facebook, yeah. And I will link to that in the show notes here if you just slide across the little Garden Fork radio icon, at least in iTunes, if you just touch the touch the logo and slide it across while this show's playing, it'll have some text 
and it'll have some important links like the link to our Patreon page where you can become a patron of Garden Fork and also our Amazon shopping page. If you start right. your shopping experience at Amazon there, we get a little finder's fee. So um, I actually saw another article in the Times about um, the microbiome. And of course, I've lost it. Maybe I sent it to Rick, but we could talk about that again. But my neighbor uh, got a SCOBY, a kombucha SCOBY from a friend in Portland, of all places. How unusual <laughs> that they would have SCOBY in Portland. But um, he's going to grow it out and then he's going to slice it in half and give me the other half. And so we're going to make some start. kombucha. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things that he really emphasized is how um, things have gotten worse for our microbiome it's ever since we got away from truly fermented foods. And so... Uh, you know, your homemade yogurts, uh, your homemade pickles that are fermented, all all that kind of stuff is in the kombucha is is really good for you. And um, it's it's the way you can help your gut get back in shape and, and stay that way. Cool. Kombucha is boomerang. That's what I say. <laughs> so you uh, you kind kind of had like maybe your third midlife crisis here and you you wanted to buy an airplane and instead um, you settled on a bicycle. Yeah, it's uh, it. It kind of started off. Um, I, yeah, I'm I'm a private pilot. I haven't flown in a while, but uh, and I, I was looking at Gail before she left, and I said, um, "Honey, I feel this urge to either buy an airplane, another boat, or an electric bicycle." And she says, "Bicycle." <laughs> <laughs> I had, in the very beginning, uh, several years ago now, uh, invested in a, a Kickstarter program for an outfit called Karmic Bicycle, uh, K-A-R-M-I-C. And you can find them on the uh, internet at Karmic Bikes. And um, I postponed taking my delivery of my of that first uh, round of bicycles. Uh, one, because there were a lot of people that wanted them and I, I didn't necessarily want to get in right at the beginning, but they came up with a better street model. And this bicycle is designed from the ground up, uh, the frame and everything, it's not a stock frame, um, to be an electric bicycle. And it's just really well thought out, well engineered. Uh, it's one of those. It's called a pedal assisted bicycle. You, yes. if you, if you're not cranking, it doesn't give you any power. And mostly, I wanted that because I have a couple of times gotten farther away from the house than I could pedal back, huh? uh, and uh, and I, yeah, I'd kind of poop out. And I said, well, I, yeah, I kind of need to make sure I don't have that problem anymore. So going outbound, I'll uh, uh, pedal it without any assist, except maybe on um, a couple of little overpasses that go over water. But um, and then on the way back, if there's headwinds or, you know, if I'm really pooped or something, I can get the pedal assist and, and make it on home. And so it gives me a little more confidence. But it also is just really cool technology. Um and uh, I, I just love this bicycle. Mine is the S model, uh, if you uh, go and look at it on the site. And it, it's just a great commuting bike. And that's, that's the real purpose of most of these bikes. Um, and they're not to zoom around town like little, uh, you know, uh, motorcycles or something, right, right. scooters. But if you want to get some exercise and you can commute to work, and uh, here our commute distances are pretty far, but you don't want, you can't afford to show up at work smelling like a horse, uh, then, you know, this is kind of a good way to, to get your exercise, get some fresh air. Uh, a lot of people here commute. Uh, we have a very flat effluvial plane that we live on. And so a lot of people commute by bicycle, and it's just a nice way to uh, to get around town and, and get some exercise. You really feel refreshed when you get someplace. And uh, yesterday I had it down at the um, uh, the ocean front, and I was riding it along the boardwalk, and uh, uh, you know it was just it was just a good way to get around. And I, I love the bike; it's um, uh, really well outfitted. And now it even has a uh, and I had to add this, but it has a, a stoplight in the back and uh -huh. so it senses the gravitational forces and when you put on some uh, some brake power all of a sudden it flashes bright red and, and holds that and so it's like a, a car stoplight and uh, yeah you got to kind of watch people when they're driving around here so yeah, you know, every little bit helps you know good for you we have uh 
I ride my bike here in New York City, actually, as much as I can. And they are making more and more avenues bike friendly. And 4th Avenue in Brooklyn, if you, any of you all are familiar with that, they are physically partitioning off. They're taking what was the parking lane, which is the closest to the curb. They're mm-hmm. m- moving that parking. They're making a bike lane with what's called a jersey barrier, a cement barrier. Right. And then just to the left of that, if you're looking down on top of the avenue, then there'll be parking and then the regular two lanes of cars. So if a car, you can't get hit by a car because the cars will hit the parked cars before they hit you. The only trick is you have to go through intersections still. But the idea of taking this avenue, which is a massive avenue, and making it bike friendly is pretty cool. I'm very excited about it. Yeah, no kidding. Uh, we're trying to get better here in Virginia Beach about uh, uh, getting some bike lanes. Uh, we have a lot of, the in the touristy places, we have a lot of really great bike paths. But as people uh, expand out more, they're they're redoing many of the roads, you know, where, you know, the bike lane's on one side for a while, and then it's on the other side. And they, they instead of having two lanes, you know, one going up and one coming back, uh, they put them on the same side and it was just really kind of a hodgepodge and they're they're straightening that out the the bike lobby is very strong in virginia beach good for you guys Maybe you haven't heard about this, but you probably have because I keep bringing it up. Uh, we do have a ongoing contribution program through Patreon for Garden Fork. It's uh, giving a couple bucks a month, kind of like uh, PBS does, you know, you're a monthly supporter. And I wanted to thank uh, a bunch more people who had signed up for that. I've been a little remiss in thanking them personally, so I wanted to read off the second half of our list, I read off the first half in the previous show. So um, if you're interested, there's links in the show notes. So just go to patreon.com slash garden fork. You can give a dollar a month, three dollars a month, or even more than that a month. Whatever you really feel comfortable with. I kind of think of it as a cup of coffee a month for Garden Fork. So um, that helps pay the bills, helps keep the lights on here at Garden Fork. But let me go with a couple more people here, all right? Clarissa W., who I, Clarissa, I don't have an address for you here. Uh, Michael B. from Broadlands, Virginia. Steve N. from Alberta, Canada. Matt Mansfield, I think, oh no, I don't see that here. Um, J.D. Wilkins from Burlington, North Carolina. Uh, Sean G. from Springfield, Massachusetts. I know Sean, I've talked to him. Beth R. from Newton Square, Pennsylvania. Chris B. from Sandy Hook, Connecticut. David and Sandy from Galway, New York. Brian G. from Westport, Connecticut. Karen B. from Wilson, North Carolina. And Myra S. from Oak Hill, Ohio. Kent B. from Stillville, Missouri. Anthony M. from Carthage, Missouri. Two from Missouri in a row there. Kenny B. from Cedar City, Utah. Alan G. from Surprise, Arizona. I love that name. Uh, Jeff M. from Raleigh, North Carolina. I've heard from Jeff a couple times. Troy B. Um, oh, I know Troy. He knows who he is. Uh, we talk on Twitter sometimes. Uh, Daniel E. from Los Angeles, California. Um, let's just say uh, Mr. Howard from Jacksonville, Florida. Uh, Vincent from Frederica, Delaware. And most recently, uh, Brad J. from Weaverville, North Carolina. So those are our current uh, patrons, monthly ongoing patrons. Also, uh, you could also help us by using our Amazon link as well. I'll talk about that later. But thank you, patrons. And just thanks, guys, for listening. I just appreciate it. It's, it's a small audience, and the feedback I get is pretty amazing. So, all right, on with the show. All right, I saw an article um, in the New York Times, and they talked about the power of positive people. Are your friendships giving you a boost or bringing you down? And um, I kind of have firsthand experience with this, but it basically, I will summarize it. Uh, are you, the lead uh, sentence is, are you spending time with the right people for your health and happiness? 
Uh, while many of us focus primarily on diet and exercise to achieve better health, science suggests that our well-being is also influenced by the company we keep. Researchers have found that certain health behaviors appear to be contagious and that our social networks in person and online can influence obesity, anxiety, and overall happiness. Okay. A, a recent report found that a person's exercise routine was strongly influenced by his or her social network. And I totally believe that. Well, sure. And uh, boy, I've uh, learned to dump toxic people, uh, you know, both online and, but just in person, you know, I, uh, I'll, I'll say hi to them. I don't cut them off, but I don't spend time with people that, uh, are kind of Debbie Downers, you know, it, uh, yeah, yeah it, it is, it, there's no future in that. And, uh, you know, they, they want you to commiserate with them all the time and everything's so bad. Although I did, I, I well commended you. I wanted to commend you as well on your excellent handling of the, uh, uh, talk about, um, uh, you know, bringing a little civility back and, and, uh, and not getting sucked into every little, uh, internet meme that goes around. Uh, you did really well with that. All so, right. My piece. <laughs> <laughs> so back to, um, back to hanging out with cool friends. Um, ah. friends can exert a measurable and ongoing influence on your health behaviors in a way that a diet never can. So yeah, I, um, I have some friends who I realized were kind of making me a little nutty, and I once I still keep in touch with them a little bit, but I am much better off when I do spend time with them. My brain starts to hurt, you know, <laughs> right? It's just like yeah, it's a, and I'm like, okay, I just so like they say, if you want to play better tennis, hang out with better tennis players, you know? Oh yeah, yeah. Not that I'm playing better tennis, are you? No, but um. <laughs> I know you, what they mean. They yeah. go on in this article that says, uh, you can just put people together who want to change health behaviors, organize them around a walking or plant-based potluck. Uh, we nudge them into hang out together for 10 weeks. We've created these groups that are now several years old, and they are exerting a healthy influence on their members' lives. So I, I see that here in New York and upstate where people just get together and go for a walk, and that's great. Mm, nice. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, a kind of a follow-up on that is there was an article in NPR that if you are mildly dehydrated, it can affect your mental game. Oh, yeah. Was it hard to concentrate during that long meeting? Does the crossroads <laughs> seem a little tougher? You could be mildly hydrated. Dehydrated. So, yeah. yeah. I, uh, I, I hydrate maybe too much, but... I, I've always been a water hog. I, I, I drink tons of liquids and I, I try to stay on top of it. Um, but you know, particularly, uh, this time of year, uh, outside it's, it's pretty brutal out there. I know you and I both get to the point about, uh, mid August, uh, first September where, uh, you know, like, okay, you know, this is enough summer for a while. I'm, uh, you know, I'd, I'd like a little bit of cooler weather. So I'm uh, kind of looking forward to it. I think a little early this year, but it's been a brutal, uh, uh, somewhere in a lot of places in the country. Yeah. This article says, um, we find that when people are mildly dehydrated, they don't do, they really don't do as well on tasks that require complex processing or on tasks that require a lot of attention. Um, how long does it take to become mildly dehydrated in the summer heat? Not long at all. The study shows, especially when you're exercise out, out outdoors. If I were hiking at a moderate intensity for one hour, I could reach a 1.5 to 2% dehydration rate. And for an average person, 2% dehydration equates to sweating out about a liter of water. So there you go. So you can, uh, you can reach this level within an hour. So remember to hydrate and then you will be smart like me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Well, let me see what else we got here. You know, on, um, the Facebook page, which has been doing really well. It's the garden fork discussion group. Um, uh, some great discussions going on about right now, what size, uh, uh, cast iron, um, Dutch uh, oven, pot, Dutch oven to buy. And, uh, you've got videos on how to use those, don't you? Yeah. How to season cast iron and whether you can use soap on cast iron, very controversial subject there. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, you know, whether to get a footed one or a, um, uh, a flat bottomed one, uh, make sure the, uh, the, the top is, uh, made to hold coals on top of the, the, uh, that it has a the, lip. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's it. That's it. A lip. Um, I mean, if you, you're, know, if you're wanting to cook outdoors with your cast iron, you should get one with the little feet and a lid that has a rim on it. So you can put 
coals underneath it and you can put coals on the top and the coals on top don't fall off. If you already have one and it has a smooth bottom and a smooth top, you can make little aluminum foil balls as little legs and then an aluminum foil ring around the top like a little aluminum foil hat like Rick and I wear all the time. Um, <laughs> and that will keep the uh, coals from falling off the edge. So I would get both. They're, they can be expensive, but I, you can find them on sale. So, mm -hmm. Oh, you can find them in, um, in uh, uh, garage sales all the time. And then you uh, could uh, then you could reseason it using some of our videos. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then uh, you know some questions about everybody's uh, garden is coming in. I have to admit I have had the uh, uh, the worst summer in a long time in tomatoes. Uh, I don't know exactly what happened, but nobody around here is doing uh, big tomatoes. But uh, uh, Stephanie Norton on the uh, on the garden foot page or on the the, the garden fork page on Facebook, uh, has had a record crop and she's been, um, wanting to know how to preserve them for, um, you know, for use this winter. And so a lot of good discussion, uh, going on there as well. Yeah. That's on the uh, Facebook discussion group. If you just type in, go to Facebook and type in garden fork, it should show up there. i uh, link in the show notes here. Um, there is also, I posted, um, our podcast from last week with Will mm -hmm. and we were talking about honey being, shipped from China to another country, relabeled, and then shipped here. Uh, William wrote, uh, you talked about honey being shipped in from China. Check out the Netflix, Netflix series called Rotten. They have an episode about that. Oh, really? Yeah. I, I didn't even know that was a... Um, I'd read an article about it, but I didn't know anybody had made movies or, or an episode about it. So I want to see that. Uh, it's really amazing. And you guys covered it last week, or, or actually I heard it yesterday on um what was that uh, garden fork 483 the garden the forest is alive with mushrooms <laughs> you guys are are braver than i am I, I guess it's because i'm not really confident in my color vision which means i'm pretty red green colorblind but i look at mushrooms and, and you read i've got a couple of the guides and i tried going out and doing the spore prints and y'all you know, and it all kind of comes down to sometimes color and uh, it's one of those things where, you know, color will kill you. <laughs> yeah. And so I thought, well, I'll just buy mine in the store. But um, I, I admire you guys for being able to go out there and uh, and pick through these things and, and get them. Yeah, there's there's a couple that are pretty obvious to me, and that's what I stick with. I mean, there's a lot. I have no idea what it is. And then people will, like, email me pictures and go, what is this? And I'm like, I have no idea what that is. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, go ahead and take a bite and see. Yeah. You know? Yeah. No, the, but, but I, the, the, the fried chicken mushroom is a pretty obvious one. So. Yeah. We well, also, we talked about uh, using sponges and Penny wrote on our Facebook group on the subject of sponges. I've been cleaning houses professionally for over 20 years. I do not use a sponge, nor do I have one in my house for those clients that I cannot convince to ditch them. I give them the following advice, bleach them frequently microwave them carefully weekly, watch them because they can melt in the microwave and burn or run them <laughs> through your dishwasher every time you run it. So, yeah. Uh, well, there are better things to use than sponges. And um, what do you uh, use? Uh, oh, me? Yeah. I, uh, I use a wet dog. You know, I just uh, <laughs> you know, put a terrier on the counter and rub around and, and then they'll lick whatever it is off the other dog. Yeah. <laughs> I have a, a, a scrubber right now. It doesn't even, it doesn't have a sponge back on it. And I like, Oh, I mm -hmm. guess that's kind of a little better than a sponge. And I've also heard that running it through the dishwasher does not disinfect it nearly as well as putting it in bleach. So, um, Monica is probably talking back at the podcast right now. She's our food safety expert up in Chicago. Mm -hmm. She's actually coming to New York this fall. I see that. Yeah. So I will see her. So that'd be good. So that'll be fun. Also on the Facebook group, uh, Will from last week's podcast, he posted some pictures of the mushrooms that he did harvest and also a kind that I don't know what they are. Um, and he also did, he, fro he froze corn on the cob. Well, they, they shucked it off. They removed it. They took the kernels off the cob mm -hmm. and then froze it, which I think is kind of a masochist thing to do. I, Frozen corn from the store works pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, and uh, I love eating corn on the cob. 
you know, just the, the tradition of kind of rolling it in that special little tray plate that they have yeah. and put a little butter, some pepper on it. I don't put salt and, uh, and eating it off the cob. That's one of the great joys of summer for me. Here in my uh, neighborhood of Sunset Park, which is a huge Latino population, they uh, put cheese on corn. They have corn on the cob. They sell on the street vendors, and it has a, a it's called queso or queso. Uh, queso. It's a, mm-hmm. it's a it's a dry Mexican cheese, and that tastes pretty good. So you know, there is something about cheese and corn that is synergistic as a flavor. Um, you know, I I cook a, a lot of Tex-Mex here around the house. Uh, we grew up on the border, and um, and I, I just love the flavors that go with a, a good sharp cheddar and some corn. Oh, now I want a grilled cheese sandwich. <laughs> Do you shop on Amazon? I shop locally and also on Amazon and other online stores. If I need something very specific, like seat covers for the new used car we just bought, I will go online and sometimes use Amazon. And Garden Fork happens to have a dedicated shopping page on the Amazon site now, which is very cool. It is an affiliate linked page. We do get a finder's fee for anything that you buy when you start shopping from that page. But I list there interesting items that I think are worthy of the Garden Fork DIY person. It's amazon.com slash shop slash Garden Fork. If you would start your Amazon shopping experience, no matter what you're looking for on Amazon, Start it at Garden Fork, and that would be great. It's Amazon.com slash shop slash Garden Fork. That's Amazon.com slash shop slash Garden Fork. You know, uh, how are the bees doing? They're good. I'm uh, going to do the second honey harvest tomorrow. I slipped in the escape boards on the two hives yesterday, and I'll give them two days. The escape board is like a one-way exit. It's like a one-way turnstile in a way. So the bees leave the honey supers, the honey boxes, and it keeps them from going back up in there. And that way, when I pull them off, there are much, much fewer bees. And I just shake the, I brush them off or shake them off. And also the, the second harvest isn't nearly as, I don't have nearly as much honey. Two of the boxes are kind of light. So I'll take out the capped honey, but I'll, the uncapped honey, I'm going to put back in the hive and let them pull that all off. And yeah. put, it, put it down in the brood supers. We're going to, after this, I'm going to, one of them I'm going to requeen because the, the, the hive's just a little cranky. And then I'm going to do a mite treatment and then get them ready for winter. That's the next steps. Okay. Well, it takes a little while to do all that. Have you ever tried a fume board? I have. I just find it, uh, for everyone that's asking, a fume board is, it's kind of like a towel on a piece of wood. And there are these various uh, sprays that you can spray on that have this smell that is just abhorrent to the bees. And you put it on top of the hive and it forces them out of the honey boxes down into the brood boxes. But the, the two times I did it and I use it's an organic spray. It doesn't it's not toxic to the bees, but they man, they just did not like it. And I thought mm. the bee escape is passive. Yes, you have to go to the hives twice. You have to take the you know supers off, slip in the escape board, but I don't know. It's just it, it works for me. So mm, okay, well that's good to know. You know they're actually uh, using honeybees to save uh, elephants in Africa now. Yes. Yeah. They uh, they have discovered that the uh, elephants are very sensitive to the alarm pheromone that uh, bees have that really they release when they are they cr- are crushed or they're in an angry mood, and so that. Pheromone smells, if you get enough of it in concentration, it smells kind of like rotten bananas to me or, or very overripe bananas. But the uh, uh, elephants are afraid of that. They've learned to be afraid of the bees and that pheromone because their trunk is a very sensitive organ. Right. And so now they're uh, manufacturing that pheromone artificially, hanging it in trees and using it as a border to keep the elephants uh, in a specific area and away from where the poachers are and that kind of thing. And I thought that was pretty neat. Yay. (laughs) Yay. Use what you got. (laughs) That's it. All right, cool. Well, I imagine people are at their destination now. I hope so. They're done with Eric and Rick. Yeah. If they're commuting on their bicycles, I hope they had a good ride. I can't wear headphones while I'm on the bike. Really? Yeah. I need to hear what's going on. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, 
Well, I, I'm all, I'm almost afraid sometimes to uh, even glance in the mirror about what's going on behind me. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, they're get, like I said, we're getting better about our our bike paths. And we have some really great ones here. Uh, you know, we uh, here in Virginia Beach, they have gone to great lengths to ensure that there are uh, lots of green spaces. You know, they could have just filled them up with houses and let the developers do what they wanted to with it. But they've ensured we have lots of green spaces and all the green spaces have wonderful bike paths going all the way through them. I just wish there was a way that they could connect, um, you know, neighborhood to neighborhood kind of through right. back roads and little little alleys just to slip through between uh, neighborhoods so you could find your way around with uh uh, you know, the mapping apps on the, um, on the phones and stuff, it'd be easy enough to, uh, uh, you know, to not get lost and back in some of these neighborhoods and still have a good ride without uh, being threatened by cars. Uh, well, they're working on that here in the city. So you can rent a bike here, uh, when you come visit. So, okay. Have, have they started, um, uh, scooter rentals there yet? No. No, that's a t that's a touchy subject here in the city. So I'll bet so. And I I saw where they were actually cutting back on the number of uh, Uber and Lyft drivers. Yeah, that's another touchy one. Yeah. So. Uh, well, you know, it it does kind of make sense if everybody's out trying to make uh, you know do pickups, you're going to have more cars in the area. And so, yeah, I, I don't know what the deal is, but. Uh, yeah, I guess they'll they'll straighten it out. Uh, you know, when you live in a city, you gotta live with an awful lot of people. Yeah. All, All right. right. Radio at GardenFork.tv. I want to hear from you. Please tell me what other podcasts you listen to. Are there some good indie ones like us? I'd like to kind of share the share the love with them and get their get the word out on their podcast as well. Thank you, Rick. And you know, there's always Root Simple. Yes. Uh, you know, the other Eric, he does a great job with that podcast. I just presume everyone listening to Garden Fork listens to Root Simple too. So, oh, okay. Well, then I won't mention it again. <laughs> All right, make it a great day, everyone. We will see you. Talk to you later, my friend. Have a great day. Garden Fork Radio's executive producer is Jimmy Goots of HollowBooks.com, and our music is licensed from UniqueTracks.com.